Okay, tonight we're going to look at these four things. One is that Christ's first anointing is to alleviate afflictions, or Christ's first coming is to alleviate afflictions. That's in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah 61, 3, we're going to see that Jesus brings the redeemed beauty for ashes, both groups, the Gentiles and the Jews. Uh, the third thing we're going to look at is in Isaiah 61, 4 through 9, that God's favor restores his people to a place of prominence among the nations. The church is going to be raptured, and then the church is going to come back and help Jesus uh, safeguard Israel. Uh, most of Isaiah 61 is written for the time of the millennial kingdom, at least verses 4 through 9, uh, as is um, verses 10 and 11. We're going to see in Isaiah 61, 10 through 11, the bi-ethnic bride of Christ will bask in God's beautiful salvation. This is going to be a pretty cool sermon. We're going to be all over the Bible today. Uh, next slide. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, we see that Christ's first coming or his first anointing is to alleviate afflictions. In Luke 4, 16 through 30, Jesus Christ quotes... Isaiah 61 through 62a, he leaves out the B part of verse 62. Verse 62b says that Christ will come to, um, let me go back and find it, that Christ will come. He says, the Lord has appointed me, has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and open the prisons to those who are bound. That's verse 1. In verse 2, A, he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Luke, he stops right there. But in Isaiah, it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance. Jesus Christ, in Luke 4, he stops at, prepare, uh, at to declare the Lord's favor or proclaim the Lord's favor because... He's not coming at that time as the Lion of Judah. He is coming as the Lamb of God. It's always important when you look at these verses, look at, look at them in context, and you go, hmm, Christ left out part of that verse. I wonder why. Well, something really cool happens in, in Luke. The Bible says, and Jesus Christ entered the temple, and he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant after he read that Bible verse. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, there's a bunch of sermons in there, but very quickly, I just want to say, Jesus just proclaimed himself as, as, as the Lord's anointed. And all spoke well of him, and they marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless, you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have, what we have heard you do, you did at Capernaum, do your, here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land. Now, the only way we know how long it didn't rain under Elijah's tenure as prophet is because of what Jesus says here. In the Old Testament, it doesn't tell you it was three and a half years. Um, the, the Bible also mentions this not raining in the book of Revelation. And it might be another three and a half years. I think it might mention it in Revelation as well. But that's why a lot of people believe that the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 13 are Elijah and Moses because the plagues that are visited upon the earth were the same plagues that God used Moses to bring upon Egypt and some of the other miracles are miracles that Elijah did. So a lot of people think that that's eh, going to be Elijah and Moses coming back as the witnesses in the end times. Anyway, so in verse 26, this is what really starts to tick the people off. Christ says, and Elijah was sent to none of them, meaning none of the Israelites, but only to Zareph Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, to a foreigner. And Elisha, and Elisha, there's Elijah, with a J, and there's Elisha, or Elisha, with a S-H. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. 
When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath because they were ethically woke. They believe that God can only minister to Jews. And here's Jesus pointing out to them that in the Old Testament, some of the two of the greatest miracles in, 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 in a great time of, of a national need were performed for foreigners. When they heard these things, they were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built. Some translations say a cliff, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. See, you ever get rejected trying to witness to people? <laughs> no one's have they ever taken you to like a second or third story window and like say, so say it again, we're gonna throw you out the window? <laughs> Until that happens, I suggest you keep trying. <laughs> Christ has come to alleviate the afflictions that people are suffering because of wokeness. The Israelites during Jesus' time, or at least those Israelites, they couldn't get over their skin problem. And so they couldn't understand that God is not concerned about your skin problem. He's really concerned about your skin problem, your sin problem. Right? Let me say that again for the camera. God is not really worried about your skin. He's worried about your sin. As a matter of fact, if you focus on skin, you end in sin. So we, we see all kinds of ethnic wokeness attacking our society today, and it's afflicting people, it's harming people, it's causing people to be bitter and envious and resentful. You ever been angry at someone and you realize that you feel really yucky because you're not feeling good about another person, and you say, God, I just want to get relief. I don't want to feel this way anymore. Well, there are a lot of people in our society that are walking around full time feeling bitter and angry and resentful. They're feeling all these yucky things because they are trapped in wokeness. And we believe that God wants to alleviate us all the wokeness. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, where Jesus, in, in, in uh, Isaiah 61.1 and in Luke 4.18, Jesus represents himself as the Redeemer during his first coming. He, he doesn't yet get into the fact that he's going to be coming back as the Lion of Judah. He's really focused on coming, coming as our, our Redeemer and Healer. So during Christ's first coming, it's recorded in the Gospels. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, history lessons, biblical history lessons, so that you can get, kind of get these details straight in your head. This is just the first one. We're going to, re we're going to review this in greater detail in a, in a few more slides. Now, during Christ, his first coming is recorded in the Gospels. And that, that is captured in Luke 61, 1 through 2a. Then there is going, Christ is going to come back. He's not going to touch the earth. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, we will meet the Lord in the air. He's going to come back to rapture the church, church which at that time, mostly will, which will consist of Gentiles. He's going to return a third time in Revelation to rescue and restore Israel. In Christ's millennial kingdom, Jerusalem is going to be uh, his headquarters. Now, I was talking to a Christian yesterday who said, you know, you're about seven or eight years ahead of society. I said, what do you mean by that? Oh, ahead of the church. I said, what do you mean by that? Well, everything you say from the Bible is true. But the church isn't ready to hear it. The church just wants to focus on love. So I said, all right, you're saying that the church believes the Bible, right? But it only wants to focus on love. Does the Bible portray Jesus as just a loving guy, or does it portray him as both the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah? The Christians said, well, obviously both. I said, okay, so if Jesus, she, the Christian said, Jesus is going to, he's loving us in the heaven right now. I said, okay, what happens on Judgment Day? Well, Jesus who loves us, he will receive us in the heaven. I said, that wasn't a question. That's part of Judgment Day, but what happens to the other people? Have you ever read John 5.22? Jesus says this in John 5.22 and 23. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I said, now, obviously God is love and Jesus loves us, but is that 
are, are you interpreting that love means that Jesus Christ accepts anything that we do, any way that we do it, and he has no standards? No, 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 I'm not saying that. So can we ask you this question? Are you as a Christian, are you in love with the love of God? Are you in love with the God of the Bible who reveals himself consistently from Genesis to Revelation? If you say the church just wants to focus on love, you have to be careful because you may just be in love with the love of God as opposed to being in love with the God of the Bible who reveals himself consistently from Genesis to Revelation. Revelation 5, 5 says this. I'm going to read 1 through 5. Uh, this is John the Apostle. He's getting this glimpse of the God's throne room in heaven. And he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him, meaning Christ, who was seated on the throne, uh, this is God seated on the throne, with, written within it on the back sealed with seven seals. Okay, these are the seven seals of God's wrath. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals of wrath upon the earth? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly, says John, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look on it. And one of the elders, there's 24 elders, said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And in Revelation chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to open God's scrolls of wrath upon the earth. And in, I, and in Revelation 6, 13, I believe it is, the powerful and the weak of the earth, they run into caves and they say, or mountains and caves, and they, and they say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Are we in love with the love of Jesus? Or are we in love with the Jesus of the Bible? Next slide. Christ came to alleviate afflictions. It says in Isaiah 61, 1, to bring good news to the poor. The word poor means that you are afflicted by depressed circumstances. It's not really a financial thing. It can be. But if you're poor, if you have no money, you're, you're afflicted. <laughs> I've known some wealthy people who have told me, you know what, I worry a lot about my money. So I'm afflicted too. All right. Now, he came to bind, that means to heal, to mend, to relieve the brokenhearted. You know what the word brokenhearted means? It means those whose hearts have been broken down either by their own mistakes, by misfortune, and destructive circumstances, both of which could come about by misfortune and your own mistakes. The Bible says a man chooses his way, and then he rails against God. Oh God, why are you doing this to me? You made those choices. I, I, you don't have to fill all those in. I gave you some options, but if you want to fill them all in, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> I love teaching the Bible, but boy, is it challenging at times to make all the connections and to keep them all straight and sequential so we can understand them. Ready? Now, next slide. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, we see that Christ is anointed to heal hearts. The heart says, well, this is uh, in the Hebrew. The heart is the inner person, the seat of our motives and determinations and passions from which stem our moral character. The Bible says in um, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? I've been on a couple of committees, and sometimes a person on the committee will say, well, we just want to know what's in their heart. And I'm like, you can't understand what's in somebody's heart. Jesus does not tell you to be a heart inspector. He tells you to be a fruit inspector. By their fruit, ye shall know them. Because, well, we just want, anytime I'm on a committee and someone says, well, we just want to know their hearts, that's a person trying to control the situation. And every committee I've ever been on, I was a young man, I've been on committees, didn't know what to do about that. And that, now I recognize it. When people start saying, well, we just want to know what's in your heart. That's the language of control. That's not the language of progress. 
Because you can't know what's in somebody's heart. You can only try. I, I tell them, we'll find out what's in your heart when we, when we start. We'll see how they behave over time. Now, the heart is synonymous with the soul in Scripture which is the effective center of our being, the capacity of our moral preferences. And that's both in the Hebrew and in the, in the uh, 1828 uh, Webster's. Kind of an interesting concept. The Bible says we're supposed to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Now, the heart, in my opinion, or the soul, is the meeting place of mind, and feelings. Romans 12, 1 through 2 provides for transforming our thoughts to those that are like God's. It says, if we think God's thoughts, it says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you think a thought, you're going to get a feeling. If I pull from behind the screen a Black Lives Matter sign, you guys are all going to get some thoughts about that. What, what's going on through your, your mind is going to trigger some emotions. What you're thinking is going to trigger some emotions. You know, I used to tell my high school students, suppose I open up my briefcase and I pull out of Uzi instead of, uh, you know, my books and, and, some, and some chalk in those days. I said, you will get your, you, what's going on in your mind is going to create some very powerful emotions. Now, if you're a Christian, you would say, okay, what's he going to do with that gun? Now, wait a minute, there's nothing that God, there's nothing that can happen to me that God is not going to see me through. And because you start thinking God's thoughts, your emotions begin to begin to line up with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, etc. So if you think a thought, you're going to get a feeling. If you think God's thoughts, you're going to get feelings that are somewhat consistent with the fruit of the Spirit. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. It's not Christian magic. The Bible's very practical. All right, next slide. Now, Christ is anointed to release captives. The Bible says in, in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 61 that Christ has come, this anointed person of God has come to proclaim, that means to call forth liberty or freedom. And that word liberty, freedom, means that which has been destroyed by the sword, by the pestilence and famine, and brokenheartedness. Christ has come to liberate us from brokenheartedness. Christ has come to liberate us from the aftermath of war, from pestilence. Because of Christ, some of us never were deceived by the so-called pestilence called COVID. Now, to proclaim liberty also means uh, and it says to release the captives, that means he's going to carry us away. Remember how many times in scripture did we see Peter and Paul released from prison? God carried them away. But here's a challenge for us in our today's society, Ephesians 4.14. The Bible says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Isn't that what's attacking our world? We have all these doctrines. They sound righteous. They sound wholesome. They sound helpful. They sound positive. But they break God's Ten Commandments. Christ does not want us carried away by the schemes of wokeness. Black Lives Matter. The church has become the tail being wagged by the dog of wokeness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why so many churches, they think they're being helpful by buying into the schema, these schemes that the, that the world puts out there and the church starts following them. I don't even answer a lot of these people on Facebook anymore, the pastors, when they're stupid stuff. I've had white pastors try to tell me they know more about black people than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that, that is the deception. You listen to what the world says and all of a sudden you become, I was in a grocery store one day and these people, the clerk at the, at the counter and a bunch of people around me, black, white, 
They were trying to tell me that um, Barack Obama knew more about health care than Ben Carson. <laughs> I said to them, finally, I said, look, if you're this stupid, there really is no sense in me talking to you. I said, but because I'm who I am, I'm going to answer a few more questions. <laughs> Yikes, a hoodie. <laughs> look, at, look at number four. The opening of the prison to those who are bound, that means you're tied down, you're held secure and fettered. You know, many of our prisons are a result of wrong thinking. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. Of course, we can be physically bound also. Some of us are getting older, and we're feeling like we're, well, our bodies start to become the prison at times. <laughs> Your body says, yeah, do that again and see what happens to you. <laughs> Let's go on to the next slide. Jesus brings the redeemed to beauty for ashes. This is really cool. Christ beautifies the church during his first and second comings, during the gospel and the church age, right up and through the rapture, which is probably going to be, I don't know what you're going to call it, the, 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 the marriage supper of the church age, I guess. The marriage supper of the lamb age. We'll get to that in a minute. I don't know what we will call it. But Christ beautifies believers. The Bible says in, in Isaiah 61, 3, to give them beauty, beauty for ashes is how the, many people sing songs about that. I trade these ashes in for beauty. To give them a beautiful headdress. That means to, get, to embellish them to be agreeable to God. That's beautiful in God's eyes. He embellishes us. He clothes us. He clothes us with righteousness so we are beautiful in his sight. The uh, 1828 dictionary says that it means to be agreeable to God with an expression of dignity. It's, it's the elevation of the mind and your manner and your outlook and your speech to reflect who God is and what he does. Now, ashes means the dead remains from destruction and humiliation. The dead remains of destruction and humiliation. He's going to trade beauty for ashes. Isn't that a cool concept? And he also says he's going to give us the oil for gladness. Are we one slide ahead? No, we should, we should be on the next slide, I'm sorry. There we are. Oil is the rich, soothing liquid that brings exhilaration instead of mourning. I'll give you a chance to catch up. It's really cool concepts. Christ beautifies believers. He embellishes us with the fruit of the Spirit. He embellishes us with imputed righteousness. Abraham believed God in Genesis 15, 6, and the Bible says God reckoned it as righteousness. He accounted it as righteousness. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. You know that biblical Christianity is the only religion whereby God has done something for us to make us acceptable in his sight. Every other religion is going to make you jump through hoops and still not promise you heaven. The Jehovah Witnesses, they say only 144,000 will be there the rest might inherit the earth. Maybe, I don't know. He's going to give us the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Rich, soothing liquid that's going to bring us exaltation of joy. You know, it, 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 Christians are the most singing people. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was listening to a whole lot of secular music. And I thought music was pretty cool. And, um, but I started going to church. And you, you sing songs like, Come thou found up every blessing and I'm like wow that's a pretty cool concept you start singing all these songs and then I remember one day taking all my secular albums to the, to the incinerator I kind of expected like when I threw them in the fire to hear like the demons squealing out of them <laughs> that didn't happen though. <laughs> I thought I was going to hear like yeah! <laughs> 
because that's what it was spawned by. <laughs> anyway, let's go on to the next slide. Christ improves our outlook to grant those who mourn in Zion. Now, they're spiritual Zion. We, we Christians are spiritual Zionists, but Israel is ethnic Zion. To give us the garment, that's a mantle, a wrap, or a vestment of praise or approbation to God. I remember reading where the Bible says, give thanks in all things. And I knew intellectually that I should be giving thanks to all, in all things. And I, it must have been the Holy Spirit's work in my life. Because at some point, I got to the point where I didn't want to be a complainer. I didn't want to be a whiner. I didn't like feeling that way. And I realized the only remedy to that is to be a thankful person. Now, it does not make sense to give thanks for bad things or things that you consider bad happening to you. But I learned that a lot of the bad things that happen to me, God's using, he's using them to teach me patience. So I say, okay, God, thank you. <laughs> I was hit head on by a drunk driver. Um, I want to say July 20th, maybe it was August 20th, uh, 1986. 5.45 p.m. Because that's when the clock on my car had stopped. And the trooper came. The drunk driver ran away. The trooper comes and he goes, he says, is that your car? I'm like, nope, that's my car. He goes, is that your car? I said, nope, this is my car. He goes, if that is your car, and this guy took this old wrecked up car and wrecked your car, why are you smiling? I said, I don't, I don't think I'm smiling. I felt crying. And then he goes, you look pretty happy to me. I went, all right. My mother lived in Saratoga Springs and she needed to get to, to Albany, so she calls me up. I live in Burn, uh, Boston Lake. So I'm driving to go get my mom and I'm bringing her to Albany. On my way back from Albany, my car dies on the north wind. And I'm like, geez, you know, no good deed shall go on. I wasn't, I was struggling to be thankful, but I said, God, there has to be a reason why you've allowed this, why this has happened. I think I told you this st story before. This young tow truck driver comes and he goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a high school English teacher. And uh, he goes, well, what are you teaching? I said, well, I'm teaching him to play Macbeth. He goes, I read that play. I said, well, do you remember about the weird sisters, how they represent Satan? And they, you know, they, they entice uh, Macbeth and his wife to do the evil that is already inside. He goes, no, I never heard that before. And he goes, are you one of those Christians? Are you one of those born again? And I said, yeah. And he goes, my mom is always downstairs at her prayer group praying for me, hooting and carrying on. I hear him. And he goes, I never understood the gospel before now. I didn't ask him. He goes, can you help me receive Christ? He's got my car towing back to Saratoga. And he pulls the truck off the side of the road and he prays to receive Jesus Christ. <laughs> His mother calls me up a couple, of, uh, I think maybe that night or something. And she goes, my son told me thank you so much for being used by God. <laughs> that soul only cost me $1,100. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I'm thinking about it that way, my treasure in heaven is gone. <laughs> All right, so it doesn't seem to make sense, but the Bible says, give thanks in all things. Not all things are good, but the Bible says God will work all things to good. Not all things are good. Some are pretty awful. I was at a Christian camp, and uh, I was supposed to speak the third evening, and I got the third, third evening and the fourth day, so I got there the third evening, and apparently a girl had had a lot of trouble, and the, the other pastors at this camp were telling her that it was God's will that she got raped. So I'm like, oh, okay, no, that's not, the Bible does not, that's a, that's a violation of Ten Commandment number seven. Not God's will for you to be raped. Bad things happen. They're not good. But we are looking to God to work good in your life through the most horrible things that happen. But no, it was not God's will for you to be raped. All right? So God gives us all these things so that we may be called oaks, strong trees of righteousness 
The planting, I always thought that word planting means that your roots go deep. No, it means that you're a fruitful garden. You're a vineyard. Fruit of the Spirit. So that we can magnify, we can glorify God. To glorify God means you magnify Him in the esteem of other people. And actually you magnify Him in your own esteem. The word praise in Webster's 1828 means commendation bestowed on a person for his personal views or virtues or worthy actions. That's God. Or his notorious behavior. When praise is applied to the expression of public approbation, it may be synonymous with renown. Let's go on to the next slide. God's favor restores his people to a place of prominence among the nations. Boy, the Bible always talks about all this national stuff and the church just ignores it. So here's what's going to happen. God is going to rapture the church, which will enjoy a seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to show you the scriptures on this. And then we're going to return with Christ to rescue Israel. Remember I showed you last week what the word grafted in means? It means the two living elements, the church and Israel, come together as one people of God. God, the church has not displaced Israel. Which I believe is another reason why God is judging America. Because we can't even get our politics biblically straight. Can, you, like, can we move on? You guys got this? This is some cool stuff I want to show you. Now, this is 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 50 through 52. I tell you, brothers, want to read this together? I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Right, let me stop here. Why? Because God is a spirit. John 4, 24. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You're, at the moment of conception, you become an eternal spirit housed inside of your flesh. All right? So, all right? So, uh, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. That is amazing. All right, let's go on. So what does this mean? Christ raptures the church, right? The word rapture means that you're going to be translated. Let me read this. It means that you're going to be... At Webster's 18.28 says it this way. We are going to, the translation means it's the removal of a person to heaven without subjecting him or her to death. It is the removal, the taking up of a person to heaven without subjecting him or her to death. Enoch walked with God, and then Enoch was not, for God took him. Way cool. All right, so now we are raptured in heaven. What are we doing in heaven? I believe it's during the period of the tribulation and revelation. We are going to be taking up Revelation 120 and Revelation 41. Revelation 120, the lampstands are the churches. Revelation 41, when the, when the angel tells uh, the voice of the trumpet tells uh, John to come up here, it's symbolic of the entire church because the, in, in Revelation 4, the, the lampstands, which God now calls, they're not candelabras. <laughs> Torches. The tor it's the same word. But all the translations call them torches. It's lampstands in Revelation 1.20. It's torches in Revelation 4.1. The torches of the churches are in heaven. We are raptured. What are we going to be doing there? Well, Revelation 19, 6 through 10. We're going to be at this amazing seven-year-long banquet called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb while the tribulation is going on, while Jesus Christ is pouring out his wrath upon the earth, opening those seven seals, beginning in chapter 6. All right, now, after that period of time, Jesus Christ is going to mount a white horse I put a question mark there. Are we coming back to rescue Israel? It seems to me we are, but we've got to go. With, I'm very tempted to teach the book of Leviticus next, but I also want to teach uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel because it explains all these things. But anyway, I'm really tempted to teach the book of Leviticus next because it's really cool. But anyway, so Jesus is on a white horse. We're coming back. I believe the armies, it says the armies are gathering in Revelation 19. Who are they gathering against? 
right? Israel, the Ezekiel War, and Israel, Israel. So we come back, Christ is on his white horse, the Bible says he's coming in the clouds. Bunch of people like us wearing white, wearing white, riding white horses. And in Revelation 19, 17 to 21, there's the destruction of the earthly armies and the powers that shouldn't be the capture of the beast and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. Christians always say, God wins. Well, here's how God wins. Got it? Let's move on. So this bi-ethnic bride of Christ, the Gentiles and Israel, we're going to bask in the beauty of God's salvation. Now there's some really, really cool stuff in Scripture that, that God tries to show us this time and time again. Now, in both the Old and the New Testament, everyone sins, they get grace in God's favor. God's favor is his goodwill. See? There's one plan of salvation in the Bible. You sin, you get grace. Providing you believe. Believe with your heart, confess with your mouth. All right, let's move on. Here's some really cool stuff. Now, in the book of Luke, Ruth, the book of Ruth shows us how estranged Israel, Israel is not following God right now. It's estranged. But if God can give us estranged people grace to get us to follow him, can he give Israel grace to follow him? Yes. It's hope for our wayward children and our wayward grandchildren. God can give anybody grace to move them to follow him. He won't, bend, he won't, he won't go against your free will, but the Holy Spirit says, I believe it's in Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit, God works in us to will us to do his will. God works to give us the will to do his will. I pray this all the time. God, give me your will. To, give me the will to do your will. All right? Now, the Bible shows us that Ruth, in the, in the story of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, that Naomi is a strange Israel. She has left God's provision because there was a famine in the land. You know, when God tells Abraham to come follow me, the first thing Abraham runs into, runs into is a famine. What's up with that? As soon as our circumstances get a little tough, we think, oh no, I'm not in God's will. Yeah, you are. All right? So Naomi is a strange Israel who left God's provision, but whom God brings back to himself. She returns to Israel where God protects and supports her through the kinsman redeemer named Boaz. Jesus Christ is the kinsman redeemer of ethnic Israel because he's, he's an Israelite himself. He is the kinsman redeemer. Ruth is the Gentile bride of Christ. You with me? Who gets grafted in or married into the salvation of the Jews. John 4, 22, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Romans 11, 11 through 24 explains how they're going to be grafted in. You can read that on your own. I do have it in my notes. I'm not going to go through that. You got me? You with me? All right, one more slide. God fulfills his promise by granting to both Israel. Did I read the R out of Israel? I did. Darn it. I, I copied them. If it's the wrong one place, I'm going to copy it the next. Uh, uh, it, by granting us and Israel good news. Now, the word good news means announcing a fresh start. God brought us to Perry Road. We have a fresh start. We have yet another fresh start. <laughs> But this applies to alleviate the depressing circumstances of sin. That's what it's focused on in Scripture. But God gives all kinds of new starts. To the believer, we all got a new start when we became born again. Hey, can you point, you know the, the, um, the Puritans, who are becoming my, more and more my heroes of the faith, the Puritans believed that the born-again experience was a nine-month birthing process. You may not be able to tell the exact day. I don't want to say things on camera. I was under the influence of something and when I received Christ. And so I'm not really quite sure about the day. I kind of think I know the day. <laughs> but the point was, is, 
that at somewhere down the road, I looked back and I said, wow, my life has changed. I used to think this way, now I think that way. I, someone said to me, you know, why don't you come to church? I said to my heart, how can church help me? I need serious help. I don't need church. And I started going to church. I'm like, wow, church can help me. I thought this way, now I think this way. The Puritans did not, they didn't believe, the, the, um, saying the sinner's prayer was not invented that we know of anyway in modern times until the Second Great Awakening. The Puritans believed that you, that you would start talking to Christians, you would start dabbling and reading scripture, you'd start going to church, and over time this birthing process took place, and you look back and you say, wow, I can't exact, nine, maybe nine months ago. I used to think this way, now I think that way. Then there was no such thing as a sinner's prayer. That was invented by, I believe, Finney, who guaranteed churches that if you had me, if you held a revival with me over a certain number of nights, they would, he would guarantee the churches so many confessions of faith. I think that's who invented the, uh, I don't know if he invented it, but it was invented during that time. All right, let's pray. Look at this prayer. God, let's read this together. Lord God, Thank you for sending Christ to redeem us and include us as your children of Abraham and grafting us into your promises for Israel. Help us be disciples who you can use to lift up Christ so he can draw all men to us through himself. Make us disciples who can help your church withstand erroneous concepts so we can worship you accurately. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.